around that and what we've been doing both with our customers, our partners and as Anthony mentioned our supply chain as well. Um, a lot of people know corporate social responsibility. At HP we used to call this global citizenship. So I don't know how many of you have actually seen our global citizenship report or our corporate social responsibility report. Any of you? Hands? No? no. So none of you, or oh, one of you, one. So none of you have read the 146 pages. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, this really is, I, I print it out as you can see, it's available on the web, but this is my Bible, this is what I work from. This is the HP CSR or Corporate Sustainability Story. Everything you need to know, all the non-governmental organisations, all our stakeholders and investors, they can find out everything they need to in this one document. Um, so, you're going to ask, what's the innovation? And I'm going to talk to you about that for the next 10 to 15 minutes. But one of the things we've done, as I've said, most people know it as CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. At HP, we've called it Global Citizenship for the last X number of years. It's been a long, long time. I think the first report we produced was in about 2002. It was about 20 pages, and you can see where it is now at 146 pages. But one of the things we've done is changed the name, and it's going to be called Living Progress from May this year. So you'll find our financial year ends sort of end of October. It takes us a while to get all the information together, everything we need, and we normally produce this report around about April, May time. So you're going to hear it being called the Living Progress Report. Um, it really touches on everything. It touches on society, it touches on our employees, it touches on all the engagement we do, it touches our work with stakeholders and, as I've said, supply chain as well. So for us, it's really, really key. It's really important. Um, and one of the things that we look at is, you know, we, we see a future that is thriving, a future that is growing at HP. You know, where people have access to the resources they need to lead a healthy life, where they can contribute to the economy, where businesses are thriving, where economies are thriving. You know, we all know today that when we start to look out there and see what's happening in the world, we know that there are many, many challenges that are facing all of us. And what we like to think is that HP, through its CSR program, can start to bring all of these together and allow us to really look at how we can bring technology, how we can bring our skills, and how we can bring our people together to solve the big societal and environmental <coughs> issues that we have out there. You're going to hear a lot about the environment over the next couple of days, what we've been doing, where we're going. So I'm going to focus on the other couple of pieces rather than the environment in my piece today. So. Dave, this is a picture of David Packard. I think many of you will know the company was founded by Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard uh, back in 1939. Um, one of the key things for us is that corporate social responsibility, or now living progress, um, has been part of our agenda since 1957. That's the point at where Bill and Dave came up with this. The betterment of our society is not a job to be left to a few. It is a responsibility to be shared by all. HP exists to create value for shareholders, but also exists to create a value for society. And this is where Bill and Dave, when they used to talk about this back in the 60s, it really was, people used to laugh them out of the room because investors and people like that weren't really interested in the social piece. They weren't interested in what we were doing from an environmental perspective. So it's one of those things that HP has a long tradition in and we are continuing with that tradition today and will do so for the future. So, what, it, what does it include? It includes human economic and environmental and one of the pieces that is really important for us here at HP is that we now have a CEO who is committed to sustainability and to living progress. Um, those of you that know our CEO Meg Whitman, have any of you watched any of her videos or trailers or anything like that, read her reports? So Meg has really started to champion sustainability 
both inside HP and outside HP. It started sort of last year where Meg at an all employee meeting, she invited our Vice President of Sustainability and Social Innovation to come along and present to all our employees, so 300,000 plus employees. It was a virtual presentation, we weren't all there physically. Um, and basically, she talked about what we are doing and where we are going with sustainability. At Climate Week um, in September last year, Meg actually, her statement was, business as usual is not an option. And what she's referring to there is really the way we manufacture our products, they all use energy, they all use plastic, um, what happens to them at end of life, all of these have a huge impact on our environment, on our people, and what happens to the stuff in the future. So it's all about resource scarcity, where we're going with all of this. Um, so business as usual is not an option. And she was also referring to climate change. I'm guessing most of you understand the concept of climate change and greenhouse gases and they're increasing um, levels. We're over 400 parts per million now. Um, so what she was saying there is that we really need to use our technology and our people to solve these sort of issues. You know, our customers expect us to have, you know, to be leaders in the sustainability arena, um, but they also expect us to use our technology, our skills, our software, our people, as I said before, to solve these issues going forward. We all know that, you know, the world is facing some very, very tough challenges. There's a hugely growing population worldwide. We have climate change. We have natural disasters. Um, we have economic instability. And on top of that, we also see some health issues occurring as well as we go forward. So, as I said earlier, we're talking about human progress, economic progress, and environmental progress. Human progress is really about health, the health of our nation and our world. Um, IT can play a big part, and I'll show you some stuff in a minute around how we believe that IT can help in ways that people that hadn't really imagined years and years ago. In terms of economic progress, it's all about businesses thriving and individuals. And how do we do that? In most cases, it's about education. Where people are educated, they can start their own business, you start seeing entrepreneurs, and you start seeing economies grow. So economic progress is really about education. Environmental progress, you're going to hear from uh, Jean later on, and Shelley and Shane, and they're going to talk to you a lot about what we're doing specifically around our printer cartridges. But I just wanted to touch on a couple of other areas of HP. So many of you, I think here, those of you that I spoke to yesterday, are all very much into the imaging and printing side of things. Some of you, I think, from the graphic solutions side of it. But we also have our PC business as well. So it's PCs, tablets, and um, in India, some of you may know, we've just um, released a mobile phone. There's also the other part of that, which is around our data centers. I'm sure many of you have heard about the cloud and big data. So again, that's an area where HP can bring a lot of expertise and a lot of technology. And I have a couple of slides on that as we go forward as well. In terms of environmental progress, um, Anthony mentioned the recycling there. Um, we started recycling. Who remembers? I don't think any of you are that old in the audience, actually. But who remembers punch cards? Some of you. So for those of you, do you all know what punch cards are? We've heard of it. <laughs> We've heard of it. Got pieces of paper that you used to put in there to do all the software and applications and what have you. So we started recycling punch cards back in the 1960s. In 1987, we actually started one of the first IT hardware recycling programs. In 1991, we added the laser jet cartridges, and in 1995, we added the inkjet cartridges. So for us, we have a long <coughs> legacy of what we believe is doing the right thing for the environment. So what does all this mean? 
And this is where I want to try and give you some examples of what we've been doing. So have any of you come across HP Moonshot? A couple of you. Would you like to stand up here? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so HP Moonshot, um, basically if we, we're talking about cloud, we're talking about data centers, I think the quote that we like to use is that there is as much data produced in two days today as there was from the beginning of mankind up to 2003. Now 2003 is not that long ago, 10, 11 years ago. So when we think of the amount of data, the explosion in the volume of data that needs to be stored, needs to be kept, all of us are taking photographs where we used to print them, we're now keeping them on our PC. Instead of taking, you know, 24 photographs on a piece of film, if you're anything like me and my wife, you take hundreds and then just print out, you know, 10, 15 of them. So the way we do things is completely changing. And this is all about keeping big data. There's also legislation, so if you're in the finance industry, you have to start keeping records for much, much longer. You have to start scanning them in and keeping um, tabs on what's going on. So it's all about document <coughs> workflow as well. So for us, it's about what happens to all that data. Where is it stored? What can we do? Again, using the analogy of earlier, really, I think um, we need something like 200 football field size data centres every two to three years. And again, that's really not sustainable, not with today's technology. And where Moonshot plays an important, an important part is it's a new technology that moves away from traditional server type technology. It's actually, and I hope you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, Alex. <laughs> um, it's really a technology that's based on smartphone technology. So it's, we're actually shrinking the footprint of the processors. And whereas before you'd get X number of processors in a rack, now you can get up to 2,000 processors in a single rack. And this is all about reducing the footprint. So when we start to look at it, it, it basically it's about, I think the quotes are, it uses something like 89% less energy, it takes up 80% less space, and it also costs 77% less um, to buy. Now, HP.com, I'm sure all of you have been on HP.com at some point. Um, HP.com gets about 300 million hits every single day. So when you think about it, it's a huge amount of data, huge amount of internet access, etc. Now, we run all of HP.com on Moonshot. And the amount of energy that it uses is equivalent to 12 light bulbs. So you can imagine what a game changer this is going forward. Um, funnily enough, one of the things that was said to me when we did the, a press release on this a few months ago, one of the first questions that I got back to me was, so why are you talking about 12 light bulbs? Why aren't you comparing it to you know, energy saving CFLs or compact fluorescent lamps? So, well, it just doesn't sound as good, does it? 12 yeah. light bulbs or 75, you know, it sort of, it sounds better. But anyway, they're, they're the sort of questions that um, we've been seeing around that. So, I wanted to talk to you also a little bit about supply chain. Um, so, again, Anthony mentioned that a lot of our printing products and PC products are made in the Far East. Um, a lot of it is in China, a lot of it is on coastal location, so the east coast of China. And one of the issues we started to find there is that you know, workers basically migrate from central China out to the east coast, where the work is. Um, the quality of life there has started to decrease. I'm sure you've all seen the major cities in um, China and the smog and the associated emissions and everything with them. Um, and we also found that because most of these people migrate to the East Coast. The, what happens is that when there's things like Chinese New Year or holidays, that these people go home, it takes them 24, maybe even 36 hours to travel home by train um, or by bus. And we were starting to see people, some absenteeism, so people weren't there. There have been other things as well that have been happening. So one of the things we looked at is what can we do in terms of benefiting the workers that would also benefit HP, 
And we started to work with the Chinese government on something called the Go West strategy, which was really about moving our manufacturing from coastal locations to inland China. Um, we worked with the Chinese government and we've moved um, quite a few of our manufacturing lines into a place called Chongqing, if any of you have ever heard of Chongqing. It's like a free trade zone. So now workers are closer to home, they can actually get home at weekends. They, uh, and we're finding that you know, their quality of life has absolutely improved compared to what it was when they had to travel to the East Coast. Um, on top of that, it's created other opportunities as well. Because when you look at where they are now, there were minimal amount of businesses there. So it's created other knock-on effects, and that's for other suppliers to HP. Anything from component suppliers through to people who work in the canteen and make teas and coffees and everything. So there's been an economic benefit as well for those people. Um, the final thing around the Go West strategy is very much... Does it, do any of you remember the old Silk Road? A couple of you. Um, so what HP did was it looked at, at the moment, in terms of supplying our product, we ship a lot of product via ocean-going freight around um, the Cape and all the way up to places like Holland and Greece. Um, that takes round about 37 to 40 days to ship product that sort of distance. Um, when you've got high value products, then we're shipping some of those by air. So again, there's an environmental impact there. But what we looked at is how do we actually, can we do anything to improve the logistics and the transportation of our products? And what we did was we worked with the railway companies and we've actually opened up a railway between Chongqing and Germany. And we actually ship products via rail from Chongqing to Germany, and it takes about 25 days. So we've got a saving of about 10 days in terms of shipment. Um, in terms of carbon emissions, it's about 1 30th of the carbon emissions of shipping freight by air. So for us, there's a huge environmental and sustainability benefit by moving um, products by train. There's a good video, it's a CNN video, um, that you can access on the web, or if you go to hp.com and just put um, Silk Railroad in. But there, it, it's actually amazing, and, and you know, I, mean, I, I can get quite sort of excited with this stuff. But um, the train itself, it has to change railway gauge, so they have to take all the freight containers off and move them to another um, trolley because of the different sizes in the railway. It has something like about 30 different drivers that take the train through. It's really, well, it's quite interesting. It's about five minutes long, and um, I do recommend that you take a look at it. So another piece that I want to talk about is recycling. How many of you have come across the term we, or waste electrical electronic equipment? A few of you, but not all of you. So, within the European Union, there's a piece of legislation called WE, which stands for Waste Electrical Electronic Equipment. Um, I believe there's also legislation in some states in the US, places like Japan. I know we don't have anybody from the Asia-Pacific region here. And I know that there's also a lot of discussion going on in some of the Latin American countries about bringing a similar type of law. Um, and again, in African countries as well, there's a lot of work going on. And this is one of the reasons we've done quite a bit of work in Kenya around WE. So WE really applies to all domestic appliances, so you're looking at fridges, freezers, kettles, um, TVs, but it also applies to things like your mobile phone, your PC, your laptop, servers, so any electronic equipment is covered by this legislation. I'm guessing many of you know at the end of the day, you've probably seen these um, clips on YouTube or on television, where you've got young people, people just like burning cables to try and get the copper out of them, using the foam from fridges to accelerate that, getting old CRT screens and taking the valuable bits off, like the copper yoke and what have you, and then literally just dumping the old CRT screen, either by the side of the road or in you know, a great big toxic pit. This is not good. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for the people either that are doing this. 
So HP started to look at what can we do, how can we help her, and how can we pilot some things to actually benefit society and benefit the environment at the same time. So in 2010, we actually set up a pilot project in um, Mombasa, in Kenya, where we started to look at how can we get equipment back, what can we do with it, how do we recycle it in those sort of regions. And using that pilot, in 2013, we opened a plant in Nairobi. And that plant basically has produced jobs, it's economically viable, and of course, products are recycled. And we can then use the recycler, again, in other products which we sell on or whatever. Um, so where's the benefit there? So before, as I said, people were burning the cables, just you know, basically trying to make money, scraping a living together. What we've done with this program is we've said to people that it's called the informal sector, but we've said to people, bring the electronics to us, bring the equipment to us, and we will recycle it. So the idea is that these people now go out, they collect equipment, they bring it to us, we weigh it, we then put it into a container, so there are various containers around the city. We then collect the containers, they go to the recycling facility where they're separated, shredded, and we separate all the materials that are then sent off um, to recyclers for reuse and what have you. The benefit here is that these people before, you know, they, they weren't earning a lot of money. Um, they, did, they don't really have access to things like bank accounts. And the whole solution works through something called MPay, which is mobile pay. So as long as they've got a mobile phone, we can actually pay them, and it works all the way down the chain. So from the recycling plant, we then pay the people who have the container, the guy who has the container, then passes that money, and it flows down to each of the informal collectors. So again, for us, it touches all these nice points here, which is environmental, human, and economic. And please, if you have any questions, just stop me, because I can talk for ages. <laughs> so, e-health centres. So, again, this is something we've deployed in India. It's something that we're also looking at deploying in China as we go forward. So, what is an e-health centre? Well, it's really about, we looked at, I think there's something like 800 million people in India who don't have access to healthcare. Some of these people might have to walk for a day or two days to go and find a doctor or to go and find a healthcare professional. And again, during that time, they're clearly not working, so there's an economic impact to them. So we thought, how can we help here? How can we use technology to actually improve people's lives? And the idea here, what you can see here, it's basically a container full of medical equipment. And the idea is that people come to the container, um, they come there, and in there, there is a health worker. And the health worker, using our technology, puts the patient in touch with a doctor who could be seen two, three, four hundred miles away in a city somewhere. That doctor can then assess the patient, then prescribe medicines, and there's a small pharmacy on site as well. They can get their medicines and leave. The other benefit here is, if they do need to see a doctor, or go to a hospital, all the data that's taken, all the analysis is all put into the cloud. So once the patient goes to hospital, the doctor who's there to see them can access that information, see what's been happening, get their patient records and everything else. So again, this has been a, a hugely successful program in India. And like I say, we are going to expand it to China as time <coughs> goes on. Quick question. Yes. How many of them you have right now? How, how many of those health uh, you have do you have? Do you know, I, I can get back to you on that. I don't know how many there is exactly. Okay. I don't know how many there is exactly, but I will get is back to you on that. Yeah, it's spread country? out throughout okay. the country. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. No, no problem. Um, so the next piece, we talked about economic progress. Uh, and I mentioned this was about education and educating people. So the HP um, Life e-learning programme was something that HP has been doing for many, many years now. And it was really a programme where we worked with organisations and smaller and medium businesses to actually set up a, basically a physical centre 
where people could go and actually do some learning. So we're talking about people who want to be entrepreneurs here, people who want to improve their quality of life, and it's really about giving them access to things like the technology that will allow them to train themselves to be better in putting together a business plan or a marketing plan, financial information, um, how to create a website, things like that. So it really was, you had to go to these basically drop-in centres, you'd sit in front of a PC or a terminal, do your course, and then go away. And again, we thought, but there's something like 400 million people who need access to this type of thing. You know, these are young people, you know, I think there's something like 75 million unemployed young people out there. All these people could never, ever get to a, a drop-in centre. We'd need them everywhere. So again, we looked at a technology solution and we thought, the cloud. Why don't we put this on the cloud? So again, you'll find HP Life is now accessible by everyone via the HP cloud. Um, it's available, I think, in, it's available in English, it's available in Hindi, Arabic, Spanish, and something else that I've forgotten now. Um, and we're adding new languages as time goes on. So again, it's about educating people and giving them the chance to improve their lives and improve the economies they live in. So, have any of you come across HP Earth Insights? No, that's good, in a way. But, um, so HP Earth Insights, this is something that our CEO, Meg Whitman, announced back in December. Um, have any of you come across HP Discover? Yes. Okay. So HP Discover is a big customer showcase event where I think this year we had something like 9,000 customers in Barcelona. It's where HP makes a lot of announcements. It allows our customers to come and see new technologies, listen to our strategy for the future year. Um, and Meg announced our partnership there with Conservation International. Now, Conservation International is basically an organisation that concentrates, conservation concentrates, but concentrates on tropical rainforests. Now, I don't know how many of you know, but basically tropical rainforests are really, really important to us as human beings and to our natural world. Something like 40% um, of the air we're breathing now comes from tropical rainforests. Something like 80% of our food and our medicines originated from tropical rainforests. And I think it's like about half of animal life and plant life is still in our tropical forests. And these are being destroyed, slowly but surely, and it's affecting the habitat of the animals and the plants that are there. So what, what our plan with Conservation International was to look at how can we improve the way that they work. So basically they have a lot of these sort of camera traps, sensors, and they pick up lots and lots of data. So lots of photos, lots of data from all the sensors around moisture and things like that. But what it used to do is, to get that information back to their headquarters, used to take round about three to four months, then it would take a group of 20 people uh, a good couple of months to go through that data and look at it and analyse it. With HP Earth Insights, what we can do is actually that work in six months. One, it's almost instantaneous that it comes back to um, Conservation International. And what used to take 20 people a couple of months now takes us a couple of people just two days. So again, it's about speeding up what we can do. They can then see what happens, they can then like, make assessments, and they can work with people. So the next piece here is this Wildlife Picture Index system. So again, this is something that we pulled together in terms of, we like to use this word cloud and big data, but all the pictures, all the information that they get from Conservation International is uploaded to this Wildlife Picture Index system. Now again, this can be accessed by anyone. So by their researchers, by governments, by NGOs, even by you. If you want to go onto the website, all you have to do is put in HP Earth Insights, Wildlife Picture Index System, and it will come up on your screen and it will show you what's going on, the different projects, the data that's coming back, and everything. Um, 
So again, this is about big data, giving people the information they need to be able to make decisions as quickly as possible. So I have a um, short video now that's a couple of minutes long that just talks about the Earth Insights. So if you just bear with me a second.